Flame versus Spark. That's going to be the focus of this video. We're going to talk about why these tools exist, some of their key differences, as well as some of the use cases, uh, some actual places that people are using Spark, and sometimes even have to decide between Spark versus Flame and Flame versus Spark. That are some great articles on that. And we're going to talk about all of that in this video. So let's first kind of talk about why do Flink and Spark kind of exist. The obvious reason that it has grown to such great volume, velocity, veracity, all of these big Vs, that we get to create frameworks and solutions that can actually handle and process these large data sets. In turn, Spark and Blink have both become very popular for that reason. They are able to manage and process large data sets very efficiently. But honestly, sometimes it can feel like these two solutions uh, get referenced a lot together, so I wanted to kind of discuss the differences. So. Let's dive in. One could describe both solutions as open source distributed processing systems used for big data workloads. But if we dig into what Spark is, you know, often described as, I'm gonna take this quote from AWS. Spark essentially utilizes in-memory caching and optimizing query execution for fast analytical queries against data of any size. It provides development APIs in Java, Scala, Python, and R. Uh, and supports code reuse across multiple workloads. So, it, and it also, just to kind of add a little more, um, can be used for batch processing and real-time analytics, although sometimes the real-time analytics does require a little more work. I've definitely seen Spark use a lot more in batch, but streaming is coming along. So one of the things you should have picked up uh, from what I just said is the fact that Spark provides the ability to actually interact with multiple different languages um, via its API, essentially, that lets you use its optimized query engine, regardless of if you're using Python or Scala or SQL. But let's go over some of the other features that Spark offers and we'll kind of put them up here as I'm talking. So if you dig into the initial papers uh, with Spark, one of the ones that you will find uh, is resilient distributed data sets, uh, a fault tolerant extraction for in-memory cluster computing, which hopefully then gets you to ask, what is a RDD, which is what it's awfully referenced as, especially if you are accustomed to using Spark and likely you often find yourself trying to put things to data frame, you use the to data frame function. So one, one of the biggest things you'll often hear referenced uh, is RDD or resilient distributed data sets. Basically, this is Spark's foundational abstraction essentially. The RDD provides a fault tolerant immutable uh, collection of objects that can be processed in parallel across a computing cluster. So essentially RDDs offer fine grained control over data processing, making Spark highly efficient and fault tolerant. Now one could argue that that just sounds like a definition of some complex technical concept that doesn't necessarily make sense, which is okay that it doesn't make sense because if you even look up how often do you use an RDD or you know when to use one, most of the time you'll find that if you were, for example, to go on Reddit, people will tell you to not use them as they tend to be uh, lower level implementations. And even uh, as called out by one commenter, the Spark uh, definitive guide even states to explicitly not use them. Instead, most of the time you'll likely be using the data frame or SQL API, which the data frame, and we can kind of look at this code comparison, is more explicit and lets you essentially create a table which most people will understand more clearly as you know, you can clearly have columns making it far easier to work with a data frame versus an RDD. It's also say you'll never use an RDD, but more frequently than not, you likely won't. At least that is in my experience. So let's put this into an actual usage. Uh, so let's stick on top of that the data frame API, which is basically building on top of the concept of RDDs. Uh, Spark essentially has these Spark data frames that offer your ability to interact with your data and manipulate it, you know, using things like Pandas, and in turn allows you to run complex data transformations on top, or simple ones. They don't always have to be complex. Why do we got to make things complex? There are honestly several other features that Spark offers. It's this framework that gives you access to a uh, optimized query engine that lets you run in-memory queries on top of uh, essentially their RDDs. So let's now dive into Flink before we go into the different use cases that I've seen people use uh, Spark and Flink for. Now, when we look at Flink, I think the thing that really distinguishes it against Spark is that it's really geared towards doing transformations and complex transformations um, on streaming. It can handle robust data stream processing, meaning it can actually do things as your data is being streamed and it's built for that. Uh, if we go to flink.com, you'll see that basically, uh, if you were to look up what uh, Apache Flink is, it defines it as a framework and distributed processing engine for stateful computations over unbound and, and or bounded data streams. So again, the centers around streams. 
Uh, Flink has been designed to run in all common cluster environments, perform computations at in-memory speed at any scale. And so I think that's generally the big difference that you'll see. Um, Spark, at least in my mind, initially was more developed for batch processing, at least. And that's how we use it at Facebook. We would literally be able to pick between like Presto, Trino, and for some reason Hive in terms of like when we ran our batch processing jobs. And whenever you see Flink, it generally is more connected with stream processing. Quick pause, everyone. Today's video is sponsored by Delta Stream, which is powered by Apache Flink. Delta Stream is changing the landscape of stream processing. You can eliminate the complexities of the setup and configuration uh, as Delta Stream removes uh, the need for specialized Flink expertise. You can go beyond Flink and even build materialized views and streaming applications, all with Simple SQL. By centralizing all your data stores, streaming, and batch, Delta Stream provides you a unified view of your streaming data, allowing you to gain comprehensive insights. It also simplifies data governance through role-based access control, allowing administrators to manage uh, data access seamlessly across the enterprise. Whether you choose cloud-based or private deployments, Delta Stream adapts to your organization's needs. And a serverless infrastructure means there's no clusters to maintain. Drive real-time insights with Delta Stream, the unified platform that empowers your team to build, collaborate, and innovate like never before. If you're interested in learning more about Delta Stream, then you can click the link below for a free trial. And with that now, let's get back to the video. So generally the features you see in Apache Flink are uh, their data stream and data set APIs. So the data stream API is essentially designed for that unbounded and bounded data streams. So Flinks basically let you perform state or stateless kind of real-time data processing, catering to these complex kind of event-driven applications. So when data is actually fired off, you can actually process this data versus like waiting for it to be in batch is what it, generally when you hear event-driven architecture, that's what that means. In fact, funny story, I had someone recently who wanted to build uh, Airflow for some reason into an event-driven architecture where every event would basically build a DAG, which is not what you should do if you're out there uh, ever wondering. Airflow is not built to handle um, event-driven architecture, at least not at that scale. Maybe if you're doing 10 events uh, an hour, but at thousands of events per second, it's just not meant for it. Uh, it also provides, and I think this is very helpful, exactly one's processing semantics, which kind of like it sounds like, basically means that for every event that occurs, you know, each record will be processed exactly once, uh, even if the event fails, basically ensuring data accuracy and consistency. But it has that ability to provide this consistency, um, which is really important. Now we've gone over the high level. Uh, what I wanted to do now is dig into a few examples or a few use cases where companies have literally either picked Flink, picked Spark, why they would, would have picked one versus the other. Um, there, there were a few cases in, in here where they were actually picking between the two. So this is going to be really focused on design and, and why they ended up switching from one solution to another. So we'll dive into that here now. All right, so one use case that I thought was interesting, or at least one where they were exploring kind of using Flink and, and why uh, was with Capital One. So if we scroll down, um, I've at least done some pre-reading. It'd be fun. Uh, let me know if anyone ever wants me to do like live responses to some of these articles. Um, but essentially, they kind of dealt with the problem that you will eventually deal with. And one of the reasons I will say, hey, now it's time to go to, to streaming, which they kind of call out here, which is, you know, eventually your, for example, whatever batch system they're using Spark here, eventually it just becomes their words less efficient where things start to lag behind, right? Uh, you are running a job every hour and it takes an hour and a half. So you can never be caught up, right? Because it's, it's taking longer to process that data because you're processing it every hour rather than, you know, ever really catching up, right? Like you're, you're doing it every hour, it's an hour and a half. So, you know, you're, you're always going to be behind. And then if you, those jobs are literally running in order and have to run in order, you're going to constantly, you're just going to fall impossibly behind eventually. So one of the reasons people look to stream data is sometimes not because they need it from an operational standpoint, but because they actually need to improve um, the actual performance. So we had this actual same issue happen at Facebook where we eventually are like, okay, we just need to do real time, not because we have any use case for it, but this data is just getting so big, right? Um, and that was the only time I think we ever like uh, on my team considered real time. So, and as they kind of call it out, one of the patch solutions could just be to like constantly build a larger solution or try to optimize queries and like little things. But you eventually hit a point where it's like, all right, maybe we just move to streaming. So essentially to address this, they went into Flink. So they were looking at essentially using a combination of uh, Flink and AWS uh, Kinesis Data Analytics. So those two solutions together. I mean, that's really what this article is about. They really just explore that. So first they talk about why. So what they, they think Flink will bring. Um, 
works in real time, as we discussed, really with Build for. Obviously, again, Spark has Spark Streaming, but it tends to feel more of a tag along. Like it tends to feel like something that people added in later, whereas Flink was built with streaming in mind. And then uh, Kinesis Data Analytics kind of offers uh, a managed version of Flink, so you can actually turn it on or use it. And I think things. I think I've just recently used it for what I was testing out a video. But um, if we kind of go down here, essentially what you can kind of see that they're trying to do here is they've got a Kafka uh, topic that they'll eventually try to be pulling from and they'll have Flink that will just be essentially directly syncing it to um, their uh, Amazon Aurora database. You can imagine that being any data warehouse or database, Redshift, Snowflake, etc. And Flink and our AKD is essentially sitting here in the middle. So if we kind of keep scrolling, again, they, they cover some of the other basics that you'll, you could kind of dig more into Flink. Um, but below that, they, give, they go through the process of you, one, creating this stream. So you can create the stream on KDA. And then from there, actually using code to do a basic, they say transformation. I don't know if I'd call it a transformation. It's really just kind of a data sync. Um, so first, they obviously initialize the, the code. And, and they basically are just giving you an example here. And we'll kind of wrap it up at the end. But if you ever want to play around, you, you could literally use this code. It's not super complex. They're not doing anything that um, you couldn't do um, in, in this example. They more outlined at the beginning why they switched and then they're giving you an example of how it can be used uh, to process data in real time. And then they kind of wrap it up towards the end. So you'll see they kind of initialize uh, the Flink environment. And then afterwards, you'll see that uh, essentially they use Flink and a Flink essentially DDL statement here. You can kind of see they even call it out here. They make it so easy, like anyone could read this. And essentially they are taking this message, right? They're creating a table, like they're getting a message from it that is connected directly to the Kafka topic, right? Like whatever your topic is, the connector is, Ka uh, is Kafka. You can see here topic is etc. cetera, um, you know, uh, set up the rest of the config. And then from there you execute that SQL statement. So now you've got this, this table that is connected to your Kafka topic. And what you'll kind of see as they kind of go along is they're really going to give you just a basic data sync here. So their next essentially um, DDL statement will be into um, Aurora. So now they're saying, hey, let's connect to the actual database that we want to connect to. Um, and now we're going to create a table there where we're going to sync this information to. And you'll notice that that T environment is both here and here. And that is that Flink environment that was set up earlier. So if we go back here, uh, T environment. Although I wonder if this worked because I'm, I didn't see this before. T is uppercase here uh, and T is lowercase here. So I'm sure it was just a, a mistake, but funny point. Actually, I bet I know what happened just because I've had this happen before, even though it didn't happen here. But um, often when I write articles, if I put code in, it will automatically uppercase things. So I wonder if it was just uh, probably later on with the uppercase or maybe I'm not knowing something, but yeah, that shouldn't work. Just me knitting. Anyways, uh, from there, they basically create uh, a UDF that will process the message. And basically, right, all they're going to try to do here is take the message that, if you recall, was raw uh, here in bytes and then process it into this. So into this record creation timestamp, transaction ID, device type, etc. All these other points of information that likely exist in the, the bytes, but you're going to have to process it. So obviously, this first EDF is just to kind of uh, turn it into a string and, and transform that process message or into a process message. And then as you can see, as I referenced uh, above, they're going to take that process message and then try to decode it, right? Like, so they've got this message, um, they need to now process it and actually pull out, you know, record ID, creation timestamp, et cetera. Um, and that's really um, kind of the goal. They, they end up eventually taking this message here and then loading it into that sync. Um, so they've, they've now created uh, this decoded message up here. They're now again going below and they're essentially just uh, processing it into uh, the table as you'd expect. Really, the less, rest of this article kind of goes deeper into the architecture of Flink, um, specifically Flink clusters uh, in KDA. It is a great article if you want to keep digging into it, but I'm going to jump to the bottom because as soon as I start seeing uh, <laughs> uh, Java XML again, my eyes glaze over and I just remember spring framework days for some reason. Although, I mean, this isn't obviously complex per se. Um, it's just, this is the stuff that you just have to know um, configurations in terms of like what needs to be set where. Uh, besides, you can kind of get most of what they uh, learned from the above as they were going through uh, some of the basic issues you'll deal with. And, and this is kind of one of the reasons I was less interested in it. Like, oh, 
dealing with some sort of issue with SSL certificates. If I don't have to deal with those issues ever again, I will be happy. But essentially, they'll kind of highlight um, things like I, this is something I didn't necessarily know, but essentially dealing with custom data types not supported by Flink. That was something I wasn't uh, aware of until I read this article. So I thought that was interesting. And they also give a good, decent amount of like pros and cons here. So um, obviously pro, the big thing is Flink works in real time. Obviously, and they even call it out like Spark structured streaming processes uh, also kind of exists, but it's just really data in small batches in near real time. Flink also provides, you know, the ability to build UDFs, um, which is great. And then obviously, if you have a managed service, that's always beneficial. Uh, cons, obviously, I, I know high development cost. I'm curious, I actually didn't get to this part. So that's for data sources with custom data types. You have to create custom UDFs to serialize. Okay, so they're basically saying because they have to write their own um, data processor for some custom data types, it, it's going to cost more. Uh, and yeah, it's not as mature. I think that was referenced earlier uh, when I referenced like Flink versus Spark. Like everyone, like if you say Spark, most people are like, I know what that means. I think Flink is still like, people are like, I know that it, it exists. I know that companies use it. I've never touched it, I think is, is kind, of, kind of the way that most of us feel. Like I haven't had to use it in production myself. Their kind of conclusion here is, you know, they're, they're outgrowing kind of traditional Spark uh, batch processing jobs. Um, so that's why they kind of went to this proof of concept. So this was more of a proof of concept for them, which is kind of nice that they shared it. So if you're out there and you're like, hey, do we need to go to Flink? This will kind of help you kind of follow along with that and be like, ah, yes, we do or no, we don't. So I thought this was a great article, um, just kind of giving you an understanding of like Spark versus Flink and kind of the differences. So hopefully that was helpful. Uh, now we'll kind of go into one talking more about some Spark things. So now that we've looked at Capital One testing out Flink, I wanted to look at Uber and Spark. And honestly, when you look at most of these solutions, you'll notice that they probably use a handful of all of them. At the end of the day, you're going to always try to use the best solution for whatever problem you're dealing with, and especially if you're dealing with big data and you have a lot of engineers, you're going to have that benefit of being able to actually manage multiple solutions. Towards the end of this video, we'll talk about how probably more standard companies uh, handle these solutions, which is using tools uh, like Databricks, uh, like the sponsor of this video, Delta Stream, like EMR. Because having to spin up your own set of clusters for all of these things uh, can be a lot to handle. But uh, in this case, uh, they're going to talk about, at least in this article for Uber, uh, how they made essentially Spark effortless for everyone. This is a little bit older of an article, but I still like uh, their point, which is they're trying to make a complex solution more accessible to everyone. So if we, we scroll down, right uh, at that time, um, Apache uh, Spark was essentially the foundation of Uber's big data, right? Like, and a lot of companies uh, at, at that, I mean, to, the, to this day, if you use Databricks or something similar, you're likely relying on Uber. So what they ended up building to kind of make things easier, um, kind of probably similar, I assume, to EMR, uh, is their Uber Spark compute service, uh, essentially to help manage a lot of the complexities of running Spark, right? Because just because you can, you know, set up a bunch of clusters, once you scale anything, right, you see this with Airflow, you see this with a lot of solutions, as soon as you hit scale, it gets hard, right? Like things get hard at, at scale. Most companies don't have this sheer scale, even a large enterprise, just because of the way transactions operate, might not have this sheer scale. So first, obviously, they're going to call out um, some of the complexities that they were dealing with. And if you are an engineer who's trying to get promoted, especially in a big tech role, this is kind of what you need to do, right? First, you find a problem. The example I usually give is like Hadoop, right? Everyone was writing MapReduce jobs. And then it's like, well, what if we just created a layer on top of that where you could write SQL versus having to have people write complex jobs? So you have to write out like some key points of issues that people have. So in this case, there's data source diversity. So as you can imagine, they're pulling from multiple data sources. Everyone's kind of dealing with this. You probably have MySQL instances, Cassandra. I mean, they've listed a few here, Postgres, etc. They kind of call out um, both dealing with different compute clusters, but also dealing with like compa capacity management and like having data replicated over multiple sources, multiple Spark versions, right? Like if, if you haven't had to deal with multiple Spark versions, I mean, that's because now we're, I think we're pretty solidly uh, migrated over from two to three, but now even three has plenty of, of, of new versions. Um, and of course, dependency issues. Uh, this one, this last one actually, I, I think really sticks out because at Facebook, when we had Data Swarm, which was essentially our airflow, right? What was great was that everyone was working off the same instance of, of data swarm, right? Like you don't have 50 different instances of data swarm that you're constantly having to keep dependency management uh, on track. You've got one. I mean, that just makes things so much easier. 
And so really they, they kind of called all these impacts together. As you can kind of see here, they called out the fact that the cumulative effect of these issues essentially requires a lot of knowledge and a lot of like knowledge transfer. People have to kind of keep up to date. Um, and that gets really hard, right? I think that's really important to call out that if you have a complex solution, it's really hard to deal with, not just because you need smart people to, to deal with it. Like you can have smart people, but you still need them all to be on the same page constantly, right? Like it's like, okay, we have a bunch of smart people. Now we have to make sure they're constantly communicating and saying like, okay, this is how Uber managed our Spark instances. Rather than having a very clear onboarding process, again, this was a great thing that we had at Facebook where you could just easily switch between using Spark and Presto in a, in a configuration in your essentially data swarm job. That way you weren't having to sit there and wonder, oh, how is this Spark instance set up versus the other one, right? It's, it's just abstracted away. It seems it was boring and i was gonna say it seems boring it was boring to some people but it's the most efficient way to operate um so then they kind of go over to the general spark development kind of workflow that they, they called out i think this was more of i'm assuming the data science workflow um as it kind of called out here data science workbench i um, they're kind of showing more graphs and charts versus maybe your traditional data engineering workflow although below they do say converting a prototype into batch applications which sounds more traditional right a data scientist builds something a data engineer likely uh, sets it up, although maybe they had the data scientists setting it up. They didn't learn from Airbnb's mistakes. Uh, and then from there, essentially, they do have Airflow. So they go from, you know, doing some sort of data science workflow, converting that into some sort of batch application, and then pushing that to production um, into something like an Airflow. That was kind of their their flow of, of pushing things into production. And obviously they're, they're going to call it like different clusters. So in this case, they each of these clusters both have different compute and also storage, right? Like there's uh, a number of compute clusters as well as the storage service um, that's basically a copy in, in multiple regions. So each region has its own copy of, yeah, important storage services. Um, then they call out below that there were two main types of clusters. Uh, so they were talking about Yarn, which uh, is basically focused on handling the ETLs and then Peloton, not, not the company, basically a scheduler. Uh, the scheduler is interesting because Airflow has a scheduler, so I probably would have to dig into more like what this scheduler does different than Airflow's. Like Airflow's scheduler is, is far from perfect. I will admit it is a little clunky, but it does have one. From there, they have some layers of abstraction, which I think you'd expect. So this Uber um, Spark compute service that they've essentially developed has a gateway that you can send these jobs to, essentially you send an HTTP request to, which then will kind of help you. It'll do the... the the work in terms of deciding how to run a certain job. So my guess, at least off of reading this, is like instead of you having to sit there and figure out the best way to configure your job, um, it would do that. So perhaps this is something I'm, I'm curious, like this is one thing that I, and why I tell a lot of new consultants, Databricks is a great place to consult, is there's a lot of different ways you can like set up uh, compute in, in Databricks, right? Like GPU, you can have some things that are GPUs, you can have some things um, that are set up on various configurations of RAM. And as simple as that seems, like compared to Snowflake, where they've got, you know, small, medium, large, in terms of like how you think about compute, which is very simple, right? Like anyone can kind of understand that. Because it is this extra layer of complexity, it actually makes it a great place to consult in because it seems like a small thing, but these small bits of knowledge that you think everyone knows, they don't, uh, and it's always a great place to jump in. So I think maybe that's what this is doing here is that likely it helps kind of figure out what's the best way to run this Spark job um, and figuring out compute. So that way the end user can just write a job and not consider like, okay, what's the best way to actually configure everything after writing the job? So I thought that was really at least smart in terms of how they set that up. So then they dive into kind of an example workflow. It looks like here, I'm gonna guess this is like uh, something from the HTTP request. And yeah, so there's a post request. So there's some sort of, I'm gonna guess the name is the job here. And yeah, so here's the file name that they're calling. Here's some arguments that they're passing, some Spark. They do they do pass in some, some configuration, it looks like. Uh, but I guess, you know, as we keep scrolling, so basically the resulting request, this is, it, it's modified it. So basically once the user sends this request, um, the system will then uh, further modify it to improve it. So for example, it figured out that the Spark job that was sent over, their environment they sent was 2.1, two, two uh, but it could be in 2.4. So they're like, hey, we know this can be 2.4, we're gonna update this. It, it also ended up deciding to run on a different cluster. So even though the end user, I guess, gives it information, it will run it somewhere else. I'm curious then, obviously, like with that, um, like I, I assume you can override it if you think you know better, or maybe you might, you might, you might have a better way. But I, I do find that interesting, at least in terms of like how that that whole process kind of went through. So that's kind of their example workflow. Um, then below, they kind of talk about the advantages of the overall architecture. But I just thought that was interesting in terms of like how they took Spark 
and then try to make it more useful to a larger set of users. So my guess is, at least from my perspective, is like maybe you can even give it less information or, or at least probably at this point, if they're still using Spark, you can probably give it less information and they can probably figure out what it needs to do based off the size of data, maybe the type of joins, et cetera. But I thought that's interesting in terms of like ways you can try to improve your architecture. It's not just about writing code, you know, in the data world, sometimes it is about figuring out ways to improve the overall workflow for developers. And like I referenced earlier, there's a lot of tools that exist these days that make using things like Spark and Flink easier. You have things like Databricks and EMR, especially on the Spark side. And you know, on the Flink side, there are a ton of solutions coming out. Again, our sponsor, Delta Stream, it does make it easier if you're trying to set up Flink and not have to set up Flink yourself. Uh, and they make real-time stream processing easier. So that's great because many of these large tech companies have built solutions for how to handle uh, these more complex big data processing frameworks, whether it's Airflow, again, whether it's Hadoop and, and, and putting layers on top of that. All of that has essentially come from a lot of big tech that has then eventually been uh, passed on one way or the other to uh, companies of all sizes and especially uh, with SaaS models. So if you're looking for an option, you should try out one of those solutions just to make your life easier because trust me, I spent a ton of time trying to set up Hadoop on my own laptop forever ago and it just was a bad time. And in the end, I was never the one who had to set it up from scratch anyways. So with that, guys, I want to say thanks so much for watching this video and I will see y'all in the next one. Thanks all. Goodbye.